Welcome to Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. This is Lecture 6, Multimedia. So we spent the first half of the course, essentially, talking about things very low level, bits and bytes and hardware. Then we built on top of that and talked about software. And then, of course, we introduced the Internet. And now it's in the next several lectures where we focus on things slightly higher level than all three, things you can do on the internet, things you can do with software, things that you can do on your own hardware. And the first of those topics is multimedia, a term you've probably all heard before, but can you give us a definition of it? What is multimedia in your minds as of right now? Yeah, what do you got? OK, so watching a movie, an instance of video, certainly, and with some audio. What else? Yeah. Ooh, very deep. OK, sense of interactivity. So multimedia often has some kind of interactivity associated with it. Click this, drag this, or uh, the video or whatnot will perhaps respond to your input in some way. What else you got? Yeah. Anything that combines picture and sound. Good. So anything that combines picture and sound, uh, multi, meaning multiple media, certainly. And so individual components of multimedia are, let's say, some basics, like graphics, so still images of some sort. Maybe they're cartoon-like images. Maybe they're photographs. We'll touch on both today. Um, videos, where you essentially have lots of pictures showing rapidly one after the other, getting the illusion of motion, which is really all videos are. And then you have audio of course, as well. And there's certainly a blends of those these days, where you have animations that are nonetheless interactive and that also have sound, and hence the, the term multimedia. So one of our primary goals for today is to, like we've done in the past, take the hood off of multimedia and not only focus on some of the underlying principles. How do you make an image? How do you store a audio file, how do you compress a video, but to talk about some of the very specific file formats that you've probably seen every day, GIFs and JPEGs and other uh, file formats still, so that not only do you have a basic sense of how all this stuff works, but also when you see something on your desktop or you download some file, you also have some understanding as to how it all works. And what the upcoming problem set will actually challenge you to do is use an industry standard program called Photoshop, which you, have, you haven't used before, is a beast of a program and will only scratch the surface of some of its features. But as was the point with your Google Earth exercise, we're going to get you along the way, point you to some of the most helpful features of it. And uh, as part of the problem set, not only will you have a chance to um, design a graphic of your own, you'll be able to design your own graphic for the course's website. And we'll toss it into rotation with some of Dan's own photographs. What is the difference between Photoshop and Photoshop Editor? Ah, good question. I, I don't even know the difference. Do you, Dan? So I. I only know a little bit of the difference between Photoshop and Photoshop Elements, and as far as I know, Elements is just a, is a much more basic version of its larger brother, Photoshop. So not only is it more basic in terms of features and, and size, but also the price or the cost that, that's associated with it. Elements might be somewhere in the range between $50 and $100, whereas Photoshop, if you don't buy the uh, education price, is way at the upper end of $600. And so, uh, the price is just one indication of, of the various types of features, but typically with Elements you would use, it has a lot of very common um, image editing tools such as cropping, for example, whereas Photoshop of course has that as well, but many other advanced features that uh, uh, a person using Elements may not necessarily need. Unless that have induced some panic, uh, you will be using Photoshop for free. Harvard both site licenses it for students, so you can use it if you're on campus or connected via what's called VPN, so we'll let you know how to do that if you so choose. And Adobe, the company that makes it, also has a uh, freely available download that doesn't work forever. It's a limited amount of time, but while it does work, you'll be able to use pretty much all of its functionality. So more on that in the problem set. So yeah, so while certainly we will also be footing the bill, so to speak, don't worry about using all of the features. You'll only be using about 10 or $15 worth of the $600 <laughs> of, of the features. Even I, all these years later, I pretty much know how to like remove red eye from photographs, and, and that's about it. So. Do you want to take us on our way? All right. So the very first thing, when we were talking about multimedia, one of the very most basic features of multimedia could be just an image. So here, this is a photograph uh, that I took a couple of years ago. And it's, what is interesting about this isn't necessarily the photograph or the subject, but what we're going to talk about is what type of image this is. And so you'll notice that down here we have, I've named it something called a bitmap. What might a bitmap be? So it's something very common, especially in the Windows world, not so much in Macs, but what, what does it mean to be, for an image to be a bitmap? Any clues? 
Okay, so it's a map of bits, really, is if you want to think of it that way. All it is is just a file that contains, just in a sequence of ones and zeros, it defines each and every single pixel that makes up this image. So how many pixels are in this image right now? Any guesses? I'm sorry? A billion. A billion, that's a little high. <laughs> So what's typically when we're talking about a digital camera, what do you usually hear in terms of pixels? I'm sorry? Right, so million, but so what's the other term? So there's like a marketing term that, megapixels, megapixels right, exactly. So although the original image could be measured in megapixels, and it certainly was, it was about eight megapixels or so, this is a much smaller version to fit on this slide. And indeed, I believe the slide is probably about 800 pixels across by 600 down or some variation like that. So if we were to multiply the width times the height, you can imagine how many we would get. So we have, what, 480,000? So in this case, it's a little bit smaller than that. So we probably have closer to maybe 450,000 pixels in this particular image. Why are we doing this math? What's important? Well, realize that we have to define each and every pixel that makes up this file. So in the very first pixel, all the way in the upper left-hand corner, we have to have a couple of bytes that define its color. And then the next pixel, we have to have a couple of bytes that define its color, and so on and so forth. So I just said that we have about maybe 480,000 or 450,000 pixels. If we take a couple of bytes per pixel, how big is this file going to be? So just assume one byte per pixel. We're saying 450,000 bytes, which is about, yes. So it's, right, so it's, it's one less than that, one notch less. It's about, it's about 450 kilobytes worth of information. So for an image like this, which, you know, in terms of size is not that impressive, 450 kilobytes seems like a lot. And so there are ways that we can shrink this and make it a little bit smaller, which uh, will address in just a second, but there is an important thing to note about bitmaps. Notice that I said that every pixel is defined. There is no more information than that, and there is no less. So let's say that we took like a, a little loop or a little magnifying glass and zoomed in really, really, really close onto a small portion of this image. And you can see that this is like a big magnifying glass, and all the way in the upper right-hand corner, it's pointing to, to, to some particular feature. So what do we notice about this feature that it is blowing up to some ridiculous degree? So, yeah, it's pixelated, exactly. So this, is, this term right here, or the term that we are using for this sort of effect is called pixelation, where you can see each and every individual pixel that is made that makes up this particular image. So while we could zoom in, we could blow up this image to be very, very large and see all of the individual pixel, all of the individual pixels, we don't get a good idea of the context of it without being zoomed out. However, when we zoom out, you can see that all of the pixels smooth over and it looks as though it looks like a real picture, uh, which can be sharp or if, if your camera's not that good, it could be blurry, for example. So, but this brings up a good, an interesting point that uh, all the time on TV shows and movies, we're always talking about these people that enhance their images. They take something like this, and they're like, okay, I know this actually makes up a license plate. What is the license plate? And they have this fancy image processing software that uh, defuzzes it and suddenly it becomes very, very clear. But this is not really possible. All of the data that we have is right there. You can see just how much data, and your guess would be just as good as a computer's to what that license plate number, if this were a photo of a car, would be. And so that this, this whole notion of having this enhanced feature on, uh, in movies and such is, is, I'm sorry to say, completely ridiculous, unless you have some ridiculously large um, camera that can resolve all sorts of details. But um, let's see. So we were talking a little bit about bitmaps and, uh, and how each individual pixel actually is made up by, um, or each individual pixel, when put all together, makes up an image. And so um, digital cameras are perhaps the most popular way nowadays to take photos of something and put them on your computer, whereas before 
it was still for many years, the, the best way was to take a photograph with the film camera, scan it in, et cetera. And so uh, just very basic things about a digital camera is that the sensor inside also has a number of pixels or what they call pixels. It's just a bunch of sites, a bunch of photo sites as they're called that detects light. It captures light and it transforms that light into an individual pixel. However, that's a little bit misleading because digital cameras actually, and this is, I'm going to say this and it's going to sound ridiculous and it's slightly exaggerated, but digital cameras cannot actually capture color. They're monochromatic devices. They, there are no sensors available today that can capture red, green, and blue. However, what they do, it's a, it's a bit of a trick. They actually put these red, green, and blue filters in front of the sensor in order to filter out each of those colors. So if we have one pixel that detects red, one pixel that detects green, one pixel that detects blue, the summation of all of these is what makes one individual pixel. So this is a lot, this is, um, it's a lot of information. We could go into a lot of depth about this, which I won't hear, but the point is that really when we're talking about megapixels in a digital camera, it doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot. Sure, 12 megapixels sounds a lot better than three megapixels, but what if that sensor, what if that filter that's in front of it is not as good as the filter that's in front of that smaller sensor or this, this sensor that has fewer pixels? So, uh, don't believe all of the marketing hype just because it says something like, oh, eight megapixels and that other camera has only seven. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is higher quality. There are many, many other things involved with it. So, Don't you teach an entire course on digital photography at the Harvard Extension School? I do actually teach an entire course on this subject. Um, and it's unfortunate, that I, it's unfortunate that I have to condense all of it into about two minutes of talking, but yeah, Computer Science E7 in the spring, we, we go into a lot more detail about each of these pixels and lenses and all of this stuff. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. I don't know, that was kind of enough. Was it? <laughs> Can we actually scroll back? Dan actually is a, a brilliant photographer, and I think this photo on the previous slide is something he took on my behalf um, for another course that I teach, um, kind of outsource my skills to him. Can anyone identify what this photograph is? A hundred points of extra credit. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, true. I should be more precise. Um, that is true. It was on the website. Uh, where did it come from, though? So zero points for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does. It's not, but it does. Uh, you want to? <laughs> so minus 100. Um, <laughs> What, uh, do you want so, to reveal the source? Are you allowed? I, I'm allowed. It's up to your class if I can't. So this is actually um, somewhat of a waterfall. So up in this, this is a top-down view. This is a small pool of water in the lower right-hand corner. There's some water falling onto a, a light source that's generating all of these funny colors. It's actually in this uh, greenhouse that is in the Harvard Business School. I forget the exact name of it is the, the class of 1959 chapel if you've ever been down there across so the river right so there's a little greenhouse there with a, some neat little ponds and uh, and some neat little waterfalls and this is sort of a zoomed in version of it top down view so before we forge ahead let's see if we can now tie some of this material back to things you've seen before do you mind switching over to my display so actually take note of this and this recall is how Dan zoomed in on this picture so that you could actually see the so-called pixelation and you see that uh, you can see something similar in fact if you want to simulate this at home and get a bit of a headache walk really close to your TV especially if it's an older TV and everything will become very blotchy and that's effectively because you're coming up so close that you see the actual detail but lose sight of um, say the forest for the trees. Um, you know, we can actually um, do something like that on this computer where we can zoom in and as we get closer and closer and closer you can see each of the individual pixels that even make up not only the mouse here but uh, the image itself. So That's anyway. actually kind of neat. That cursor you've all been using for 10, 15 years now, I mean some guy just sat there one day with like Mac Paint and just drew what is the arrow of today, though I'm sure they've added some shadow effects since then. So in fact that's actually a perfect segue to this very fancy Windows program called, we're going to get a signal here, am I clipped over? Oh, Moose maybe? 
There we go. OK, so this is a very fancy program known as MS Paint, which comes with Windows. And wouldn't you know, oh, there we go. OK, so this is MS Paint. What I've gone ahead and done, and this is, um, think of this as the very, very free version of Photoshop. Um, what I've done is create a canvas, a palette, that's only 16 pixels wide, or 32 pixels wide by 32 pixels wide. But I've then zoomed in on it 800%. Uh, so what you're actually seeing here is just like a white canvas, much like an artist would have a white canvas. And because I have a tablet here, I'm going to go ahead and use my actual pen. And I'm going to, for instance, choose, let's say, this reddish color here. All right, that's going to be an OK color. Actually, let's choose, yep, that red color there. And I'm going to go ahead and just use the wrong tool to draw a lasso there. Let's go ahead and use the pencil tool and then go ahead and do something like this. So you clearly see pixelation here because what I've just made is a very simple bitmap file. So in addition to being sort of a concept, a bitmap, B-I-T-M-A-P, I'm very specifically designing a graphic, which if I go to hit save in a bit, will become a BMP, all capitals. So this is one of those acronyms that's a very specific file format. In fact, how many of you have ever seen, do you think, a BMP file, a BMP graphic? Ooh, OK, where? It's more hands than I would have expected. Four defaults stored on your computer, like what? Yeah. Can anyone describe one of those? So this is one of those trick questions where if you own a PC, your hands should have gone up. So how many of you have, say, at home on your Windows XP computer, the uh, blue skies and green rolling hills? So that's one of these Windows wallpapers that, in fact, is a BMP file. Mac OS these days, I think, tends to use JPEG files as opposed to BMPs. But what's nice about a BMP file format is that it's very very simple. It was invented by Microsoft some number of years ago, and it's, in, it's improved over time in terms of the features that it supports. But for our purposes, it is literally a file format that is just a map, as Dan said, of bits, or really pixels. So a pixel is a dot in an image. And each of those dots apparently can take on some color. And so this is what we'll tease apart here for a second. Yeah. Oh, so that's a good question. So this, it's precisely the simplicity of the file format that makes it so big. Typically, a BMP file is uncompressed, which means that some number of bits are used to represent the color of each and every dot, each and every pixel in the image. So for instance, I've just chosen my green tool here. And I'm going to go ahead and say, draw a little eye there, a little nose here. Here. So each of those dots actually is a pixel. Okay, just a little, it's the smallest unit of measure within a graphic. But what the computer is currently using is some number of pixels per dot to represent its color. So a bitmap file, is, is, uh, as in the case of most image files, is really just a grid. From top to bottom, left to right, it's a whole bunch of pixels with rows and columns. If each of those pixels is using some number of bits, let's just say uh, 24 bits, somewhat arbitrarily, well, how much space does your bitmap file take up? Well, it essentially takes up however many pixels you have across, say 32, by however many pixels you have down, another 32. So that's 32 times 32, so 900-ish. Then times the number of bits you're using. So it's the width times the height times the number of bits per pixel that gives you the total number of bits, roughly, that your actual file format takes up. JPEGs, by contrast, even though they are effectively a grid of pixels, they are compressed files. And we'll actually come back to that later tonight. But what that means is that they don't bother storing a color value, that is, a number representing the color of each and every dot in the image, because that just takes a, a lot of space. There are very clever algorithms, uh, mathematical functions, that allow you to sort of summarize the information without remembering each and every pixel. And so have any of you seen before, if you've seen bit maps before, have you ever seen mention of 24-bit color or 16-bit color or 32-bit color? Yeah, where? Ah, oh, so you got to be able to back it up if you raise the hand. When you go to save, What's that? When you go to save, it really yeah, so actually we will see it there, although I'd conjecture most of you have not spent time at home drawing uh, little pictures with, uh, with um, MS Paint here. But yes, if I go to... 
Let's see if this actually cooperates. If I go to the Save as Type feature here, it's a little small, but notice this program can actually save a bunch of different formats. A 16 color bitmap, which is a 4 bit color, a 256 color bitmap, which happens to be called 8 bit color, and then they actually get consistent. 24 bit bitmap is consistent with what I was using, uh, describing a moment ago. Turns out this program can also support other file formats that we'll come back to later tonight JPEGs and GIFs. But the takeaway here, or at least one of the points to be made is that you've actually seen these things before. If you've ever opened on a PC, say, your display control panel, and you've ever had this option to choose how many colors your monitor is displaying, this is becoming decreasingly useful these days because almost every monitor and every video card and every computer supports a whole lot of colors, millions of different colors. But it wasn't all that long ago, say, that I grew up, for instance, playing on my cousins. You know, when I was six years old, eight years old, we used to visit my cousins. He had a really old PC called a 286 at the time, um, which was many generations before the Pentiums of today. And what color was his screen, would you guess? Green. So it was mostly green. Like it was green and really green. And it wasn't even black and white. It was, again, two different shades of green. And that was what's called a monochrome monitor. And that was one bit color. Each of the pixels was either a zero or one, green or really green, black or white. And I mean, amazingly, we actually were able to play games. And I remember this one game called uh, King's Quest, very popular game years ago, where you were this little character moving around the screen. And it amounted to finding things on the screen. And back in the day, you just had to recognize that this yellow colored dot, or this slightly green colored dot that was over there on the screen, happened to represent a, a sword that you could pick up and start using. But it was because you had such little fidelity. And so thankfully, the world's come a long way, whereby your computer Computers now support 32-bit color, which is millions of colors, so to speak. I can actually pop up here and go to 16-bit color, because that happens to be um, thousands of colors. Some versions of Windows and Mac OS have kind of dumbed this down, and they just use English instead of numeric terms. But it's all very much related to the stuff Dan was talking about, to even simple programs like MS Paint, and certainly your own display control panel. So if we can just tease this apart just a little bit, what so we can try to understand what these bits mean, try to apply it to actually how many colors there are. When we refer to, let's say, 8 bits, what are we talking about? What is 8 bits equal to? Byte. Yeah, byte. So, and how many values can a byte represent? 256. Right, 256 if we include the zero. So 256 different values that we can assign to, let's say, an 8-bit Pixel. So when we are talking about bit depth, or what, what this is called here, so we have 16-bit, 32-bit, but let's simplify it, let's go to 8-bit instead. What we are saying is that every pixel, either on the screen or on your image, depending on the context, is going to have that many bits of information available to every pixel for color information. So in other words, if this was in 8-bits, every pixel on the screen would have 256 different possible colors. And so that could either be, it depends on how you assign them. The zero could represent black, for example. 255 could represent white, and you could have all shades of gray in between. Or you could just assign them random colors, depending on, on how it is. So for those of you that have been, been using computers for a long time, you may remember this notion of palettes, where all it was was assigning each of these 256 values to a different color. However, when we get up to these higher bit depths, 16-bit, 24-bit, 32-bit, we actually have far more colors. We don't have to worry about palettes. So let's just talk about, just very briefly, 24-bit color. So how many bytes could that represent, or how many bytes would that be, 24 bits? Three bytes, right. So 8, 16, 24. So every pixel then has three bytes associated with it for color information. And so then, if you have, let's say that the first byte was used to represent the color red, the second byte was used to represent the color green, the third byte was used to represent the color blue, so RGB, then you could have all of these different variations of colors from 0 to 255 in each of these slots, red, green, and blue, whose combination would make all of the colors that we actually see. Do you, if you yes. remember actually from grade school or old science videos, before there were these nice fancy projectors of today and yesteryear, there were bigger projectors with three different lenses, one that would shoot out red light, one that would shoot blue, one that would shoot green. Yes, no? 
Yeah, so I'm sort of in the middle of the age range here, so some of us must have actually seen this thing. And it's the same idea, what computers use in combining different wavelengths of light, or the, the equivalent by using three different values, as Dan's saying, one byte for red, one for blue, one for green, can you get effectively any number of colors, any color in the rainbow. So, so if I can just swap over, just to really nail this home, we have here three sliders, red, green, and a blue, and we can see the combination of the three in that large rectangular box above the, uh, the RGB sliders text. So we can actually manipulate these sliders to try to get certain combinations of colors. So for example, let's say I want all red. You'll notice that the red increases, the red value increases from zero, which means no red at all, or black, all the way up to 255, which represents all red, or you know, complete red, plus all the values in between, which is, which is this gradient of black to red. So some combination of these colors, so you can see that adding 255 red plus 150 green plus 212 blue gives, this, gives us this sort of fuchsia, or this, this very bright purple color. And so this, in this way, a computer can generate just about every color that we can perceive just through combining three bytes together, one byte representing red, green, and blue, respectively, and combining them all in one individual pixel. And indeed, if you look at your, your monitor very, 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 very closely, probably with a magnifying glass, you'll notice that there are three different colors representing each pixel, red, green, and blue. Now, this works not only for laptop monitors, but also for TVs, uh, very large style, TV style monitors of, of years back. You can see each of these individual pixels that make up, or each of these individual colors that make up one pixel. If you're at wondering to yourself, when in the world am I ever going to have to make colors out of three different numbers? Well, never fear. Next week, when we start making web pages, the means by which you specify colors in web pages, if you want to get fairly precise, is to give some text, like some font or some block of um, uh, space in your web page, a three byte code. So one red value, one green, one blue. And fortunately, you don't have to typically figure out what these values are yourself. You can just look them up in a chart and say, oh, I like this color. And the chart will tell you what the number is. Um, but certainly, there are some built in ones we'll see where if you're perfectly content using what the world thinks is red, you can also just say, make the following font, quote unquote, red. So more on that next week. So if we can just go back quickly to that uh, back of the hand calculation that we were uh, using to figure out approximately how large this image, this bitmap, would be. Remember that we said that it's maybe about 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels down. Now if we assume that it is a 24-bit image, which means that each individual, each individual pixel has three bytes associated with it, how large would we expect the bitmap to be? So we have 800 pixels across, 600 down. So multiply the two together, you get about 480,000, or we assumed, because this is all not part of the image, maybe about 450,000. So each, that's how many pixels we have times how many bytes per pixel. Right, times three. So 450 times three would be 1,300,000. Let's say 1.5 million. All right, 1.5 million. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would be able to actually do it. So 1.5 million bytes, which is 1.5 megabytes. So now all of a sudden this bitmap image, which is relatively simple, may not fit on, let's say, well, and this is sort of a, an aging example now, but it wouldn't fit on a floppy disk. I guess now, well, I know. It's kind of old now, isn't it? I have to find a really big picture now. and so we. Can, can try to get it to not fit on something much larger. But anyway, you can see that just to give you an idea, this image no longer fits on a floppy disk, if you're familiar with floppy disks of years past. So what else could we do? Because this is feeling like it's growing out of hand. Because the bigger and bigger these images get, which is certainly the case when people are taking much nicer and nicer, bigger photographs these days, as camera hardware is getting better, I mean, hopefully there's a better way to render images than just remembering the color of every single dot. And in fact, there is. When we start talking about JPEGs tonight, we'll see that there are some fairly sophisticated mechanisms for actually displaying something that's very pretty, very detailed, but using more bits than you would have to if you did something very naive, like take this BMP approach. But the other catch to representing everything as a grid of pixels 
is that as you can see from Dan's example here, it doesn't scale very well. You can't really zoom in, certainly not ad nauseum. So at some point, you sort of bump up against the limits um, of, in terms of what the computer can do, in terms of keeping it clean, and also the human's tolerance for actually looking at an image that actually looks like this. But it turns out there's a fundamentally different approach someone can take to representing an image. Rather than representing everything as a grid of dots, whereby the only means of blowing it up is to sort of turn one dot into four dots, into 16 dots, and so forth, as Dan has done here. Well, why don't we try to find shapes within the picture? Why don't we try to find lines and see if we can't, or at least if it's beyond our human means, see if we can't use a computer to come up with math mathematical formulas that represent each of the contours in that picture. If we find a circle, well, you might recall from you know, high school or whatnot that a circle is what r squared equals x squared plus y squared. If you don't, that's fine. Just remember that it was something like that. But if there are ways of expressing shapes within a diagram, maybe we could represent these images using not a pattern of bits, but a whole bunch of formulas. And the upside of using formulas might be what, do you think, instead of hard-coded patterns of bits? Yeah, exactly. No matter how small or bigger they are, they maintain their ratio. So remember that uh, if you wanted to blow up the size of a circle, you could multiply r, the radius, by some value. And you didn't get sort of a crooked looking ugly circle. It was still a perfect circle, just larger. And so the same idea applies here. And so the buzzword around this notion is not that of bitmap graphics, but of vector graphics. And a vector graphic, a vector file format, is simply a graphical file format that somehow uses is mathematical formulae underneath the hood to represent the, very, uh, the various shapes in the diagram. So consider this example here. And let's look at the uh, left-hand side first. So this looks to be a very simple picture, a cartoon really, of some cheese, a bunch of cheeses. But nicely enough, though it's a cartoon, there are some interesting contours to it. Roughly speaking, we have you know, part of a circle, that little Pac-Man thing at the top can be almost represented with a circle. And there seem to be some relatively straight lines. And I'm taking some liberties here, because certainly if we zoom in, you see that there are some jaggies here. But in fact, we, there's at least this hint that there's kind of like a wireframe underneath this. If this weren't actual cheese, but maybe sort of a paper mache implementation of cheese, when you're using chicken wire underneath, you can imagine building the same shape, even though it looks kind of cute here, just in terms of lines, curved lines perhaps, but things that you can th at least conjecture can be represented with mathematical formulae. And so that's precisely what a vector file format is. It uses formulas that represent collectively an image like that on the right-hand side. And there's absolutely some more information in there to deal with colors and filling in the holes and things like that. But there are file formats like PICT, which has kind of fallen into disuse, uh, P-I-C-T. Um, there are other file formats still. And if you are, for instance, a graphic artist or someone who does really high-end advertising advertising, publications, things like this, where you really care about precision and you want to be able to blow up someone's logo so you can put it on the side of a building or in the bottom corner of, say, some letterhead. Very different scaling factors. Well, you probably are using something like a vector file format so that your image can, in principle, scale infinitely without any loss of fidelity, without any loss of quality. Does anybody recognize this image, incidentally? Does it look like anything that you might see typically, even if you don't recognize the exact image, maybe you recognize its style? Uh, not that specifically. <laughs> well, this, is, this actually um, is, is the style that many Microsoft clip art use, uh, especially in Office, for example. It's, they use uh, vector graphics, which if you remember, it's, or if, if you've ever tried to download vector graphics into, say, Microsoft Office, you're, you'll notice that the file sizes are very, very small. That's just because the file just consists of a collection of equations and perhaps uh, some hints as to what to color or what in the image should be colored. And that's pretty much it. And so the good, the good thing about that is that once you download this vector graphic, like David said, you can make it as large or as small on your document as you want. So you could put something like this on your uh, business card or you could blow it up and put it on I don't know, a poster or a billboard, for example, and it would still look relatively sharp without getting this pixelation. And sure, you do get a little bit of, of jaggy, but that's because it has to approximate at some point uh, with these equations. Yes? What file name does Vector Graphics have? It's not like a BMP. 
What file name do vector graphics have? That can really depend on a number of things. I think one of the most popular right now are, uh, let's see, EPS, or, or um, let's see, which I think is part of the Adobe suite of applications. So in addition to Photoshop, uh, Adobe does have some other applications such as Illustrator. And I believe one of the file types that you can save in Illustrator when you've created your design is a vector file type, which I believe is EPS. Um, and those are, it's, it's, those are quite a bit more difficult to view typically than let's say a bitmap file because a bitmap file is very, very popular, very, re very easily read and, and edited. But uh, with these files, you typically have to have a little bit more advanced of a viewer in order to view it. However, there are some other things besides this sort of clip art that use vector graphics. So for those of you that have ever used the flash uh, animation, for example, flash animation uses vector graphics so that even if it's in video or even if it's in motion, the same concepts apply. It's much smaller than a typical bitmap and you can make your web browser as large or as small as possible in order to see it. And in fact, I have a sort of fun um, flash, uh, let's see, flash file here. Hopefully this will work. Okay. Remember this one? Oh yeah. All right. So this, uh, this is a flash animation and you can see that the lines look very, very sharp even though my web browser is large. And if it were possible, I would try to make the web browser even bigger. It's not really possible, but you can see that as I make it smaller or as I make it larger, we don't really get these jaggies. And that's because this is just a collection of vector graphics. So now what we can do with this, this is very multimedia of an example because not only does it include an image, but it also includes animation. You'll notice that they're all blinking their eyes, for example. But in addition, we can interact with it if this worked. Let's see if I can get this right. So I'm a little bit off, but you can see that by clicking on each of these horses, you can get them to play this sort of round, a cappella round, which is pretty fun. Can I uh, steal focus? And the, the, actually, the best part of the multimedia lecture, frankly, is that we can just have fun demoing fun file formats. Um, can I steal focus for a moment? So if you've not seen this one before, let me see if I can get it to play here. Uh, how many of you are Harvard staff or affiliates in some way? OK, so most of you. So you'll probably remember the drama from uh, a few, just a couple years ago. Let me see if we have some uh, audio that comes out of this. You should find the subject of this video made by a Harvard undergrad, um, perhaps familiar. Can you crank up the volume over there? Hello? Nah, nah, she don't live here, man. Let's make this academic. Notice how well it scales. Yo, I think you need to step off, Harvard University President Lawrence H. Summers. You mean Shaniqua's brother? Man, can't you just leave me alone? This ain't Shaniqua's house. This ain't my fault. And don't call back again. Cause if you do, you know the answer, man. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Ain't Shaniqua there? Hell no. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Shaniqua don't let me in no more. Shaniqua, 
Yeah, we can have just a beat. Yo, Shaniqua, I love you. Call me. So, vector file formats. Clearly so, an instance of multimedia, given its integration of not only a vector file format, but clearly some audio and interactivity when you click the icons as well. So Flash can be more than just vector formats as well. And, and a lot of the Flash videos that you see, for example, on YouTube now, are indeed not vector formats because they are just video and by, by default they are going to be rasterized or the opposite. But I have just one more fun Flash video to show, which as you can see, um, I am using as an example of a flash video that is not, in fact, vectorized. So I like that one. That one's fun. I am awestruck by the amount of free time some people have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did you want to say, uh, you want to take our five minute break here? Yeah, sure. All right, so let's take our five minute break. Okay, welcome back. So, during the break, a uh, student came up and mentioned that there's a, a local uh, bar restaurant that actually has flash based interaction on their website. So Crazy Carries with uh, Ks, if you go to that website, you'll notice that they actually have uh, some, uh, a pretty fun way of interacting with their website. So not only can you take a bite out of your hamburger, but you can also go to their beverages menu and uh, take a sip of your wine or um, a, a swig of your beer. And so anyway, uh, coming back to this, if we were to take a look at this, vector at this vector graphics, we'll notice that on the left side, it's this colored version of uh, basically this wire sort of representation that we have on the right. And this wire representation actually has a name. It's called a wireframe. And more specifically than it being associated with two-dimensional graphics, is it associated with three-dimensional graphics? And so. Uh, as we move off of our two-dimensional plane and into this three-dimensional realm that a lot of computer games use, for example, or that uh, computer graphics use in movies, we have to move away from these sorts of notions of bitmaps and vectors just a little bit and start talking about wireframes. And that's because these, in these um, scenarios, they actually still use uh, mathematical or formulaic representations in order to construct an image, but first what they do is they combine a lot of polygons together. So 
uh, uh, rectangles and triangles and hexagons. They mash them all together into a three-dimensional shape that is somehow stored in a computer's memory. And so we can see the... Um, what are you doing? Just listening to music. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you're entertaining yourself. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you take a look at this far left wireframe representation of this face, you'll notice that it is made up of a series of polygons. And so although they may not look like a bunch of squares and triangles, it is, they are actually made up of polygons and, and made into this shape. And so uh, what computers tend to do is start to add colors just in the same way as this vector graphics where we define colors within the equations of this vector graphic wireframe. Uh, they do the same thing in 3D as well, where you can see this second face it's just a colored form of the wireframe that we have on the left. Now after some processing, you can add some fancy lighting effects and smooth out the polygons a little bit, as is the case in this third face here. But in order to make it truly realistic, you do actually have to add a bitmap of sorts onto the face. And there's a variety of ways that um, uh, people can achieve this, but it basically is just a flat two-dimensional bitmap or perhaps some other file type that is then mapped onto the face itself, onto the shape of the face itself in order to get this sort of photorealistic representation of a face from a computer. And so there's uh, many equations that have to be processed by a computer in order to show us one of these three-dimensional faces or a three-dimensional object, uh, not the least of which is, is all the equations to represent the shape itself by the color and all the lighting that's going to go into it, but also this combination of vector graphics in a way of, of, all, of all of the math that goes into these polygons in addition to this bitmap or rasterized, which is the more generic form of bitmap, uh, the, the combination of those two graphics. But we were talking just a little bit before, if we were to take a step back, that bitmaps are really, really big. They're just far too large to be used all the time. If we have a digital camera and we were to store our 10, 12, 15 megapixel image onto a disk, you can imagine that it's going to grow in size a great deal and very, very quickly. So there must be some way that we can simplify, or uh, perhaps simplify isn't the right word, but to compress or to make all of these bits smaller, so to use a smaller file size to represent the same image. And to do that, we have to use compression. So consider these two examples, the German and the French flag. Suppose that these are stored in a bitmapped file format like BMP, and thus you would store each pixel's color with, say, 24 bits. So eight for red color, eight for the redness, um, eight for the green, eight for the blue as well. Um, why might this be kind of a waste of pixels in some sense? Like why is the BMP file format for these two images in particular kind of an inefficient format? Yeah. Yeah, there's only three colors, and there's clearly then a lot of repetition, right? If this, if this image here is like 640 pixels across by two or 300 down, well, that's like saying in the file itself, this is black, 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 600 some odd times. And then when you come down to the next row of pixels, what does is, what is the file essentially then say? This is black, this is black, this is black. And fast forward like 100 rows down, and I'm saying 100, and there might very well be, say, 100 pixels there. Finally, you hit the red, and then you have effectively this bitmap file saying, this is red, this is red, this is red, this is red. And just as redundant as my voice is sounding, so is it redundant to store that much identical information again and again. And so what's nice about these flags in particular is that this is a wonderful opportunity for compression. So how might you go about compressing a file like this? Well, it kind of suffices, perhaps, just to record the color for, say, the top left pixel. And then rather than embed in the file some identical statement like, this is also black, this is also black, this is also black, and so forth, why not say something like, this pixel's black, and so are the next 599? and somehow encode in some binary format, some computer format, that kind of idea. 
And odds are we can do that with far fewer bits than it takes to repeat ourselves again and again and again, some 600 plus times. And then finally, when you get down to a row in the file, because again, we can still model these pictures as bit maps, so pixels top, down, left, right. When we finally get to the red row, we can say, OK, this pixel is red, and so are the next 599 next to it. And so we've whittled down some statement that might otherwise be repeated 600 times into one that's stated once per row and then summarized for the rest of the row. And so compression can, in fact, involve precisely this summarization. You don't necessarily need to use any fancy algorithms. You don't need to resort to something like vector formats. You can just kind of take a bird's eye view of the file and conceptually say, you know what, I can represent the same information much more succinctly. So this is precisely what a very popular file format called, uh, do you mind flipping over? And I'll pull up the images myself. The GIF file format it does. So graphics interchange format. And GIF is contrasted with bitmap, at least early versions of bitmap, in that GIFs can be compressed. And just how that's done and what the implications of that are, we'll come back to in just a bit. But for now, it suffices to, uh, to conclude that, you know what, if you're just a little more intelligent, a little more clever, you can certainly whittle down all those redundancies into much more succinct statements. But GIFs are not sort of the best file format, perhaps, out there for all purposes, because they only support, does anyone know how many colors? How many colors maximally can be in a GIF? How many different colors, that is? Yeah, so it's just 256 because they are uh, JPEG, uh, sorry, GIFs are what are called 8 bit color. So if you have 8 bits, that's 2 to the 8th, 256. So that's only 256 possible colors. Are GIFs therefore well suited for photographs? and sort of beautiful shots that like Dan took earlier? Well, no. I mean, even though it's probably not a fun task to count up the number of different colors in Dan's photo, well, there was probably more than 256 shades of yellows and reds and greens. It was really a nice gradient of colors in there. GIFs, it would really not look so good. In fact, you would get a very blotchy result, most likely, because you kind of have this green or this green, but you don't necessarily have a nice gradient in between. And so a computer, if you saved something like Dan's photograph in a GIF file format, kind of has to estimate and round up or round down those color values, which again are just numbers. Well, what is neat about GIFs is that they, also, they can be, unlike a lot of file formats, automated. And when it comes time to start making your own web pages, the easiest way by far to make the most hideous website in the class would be to do a Google search for something like animated GIFs, uh, pick your topmost link, and what you will see, for instance, is uh, graphics sort of, if we dive in deep enough, here we go, sort of 1990s style web pages where you can so easily tragically embed stupid things like this little Intel and Sideman over there and have him dancing on your web page. There we go, in, in just five minutes time. So the GIF file format is animated, but take a quick guess as to how you implement animation within a GIF. Yeah, it's like multiple slides. So really an animated GIF is like one GIF with another one inside of it, with another one inside of it, and some kind of timing information that says show this one for half a second, then this one, then this one, then this one, then repeat. Then this one, then this one, then this one, then repeat. But so there are compelling uses for it, stupid as some of the uses for them. Um, actually, uh, what is, I'll come back to, there's a very famous internet meme which I won't, uh, force on you right now, but let's come back to this summarization and now introduce one, one alternative to JPEG. But actually, got slightly ahead of myself, let's take a look at these Are you graphics talking about again. Hamster Do you mind? Dance? What's that? Are you talking about hamster dance? Yeah, can you pull that up? You really want me to pull up hands? <laughs> yeah, but here, um, first you do that and I will <laughs> do the academic portion of the evening. Um, <laughs> So let's ask a question now. Based on my high-level description of how, the, uh, how GIF's compression algorithm works, which of these flags would you say is smaller on disk? That is, which one's file size is smaller, assuming that uh, visually they are in fact the same dimensions. They are the same number of pixels from left to right, top to bottom. But based on my description of how GIF compresses images, which of these is more compressible? Which is, can be smaller on disk, would you say? So I heard left, oh, so I heard French, and I heard left. So I heard one vote for French, one vote for German. Hmm? Go French. French? Oh, let's, all right. 
This is a nice little uh, international uh, crisis here. So all in favor of the German flag being smaller on disk. <laughs> Could you go so far? And don't think, I'm not raising. OK, so about half. And how about you are going with the French? And there's several of you who are not taking sides. A little <laughs> Switzerland kind of thing here. OK, that's fine. The easiest way to answer this is just to look at the files themselves. So I have a directory here which contains these GIFs. It looks like DE large is German and FR large is uh, France, which is smaller. Uh, looks of uh, kilobytes, gigabyte, uh, kilobytes. They're pretty small, so it is small to see there. But it looks like France is five kilobytes and the German flag is three kilobytes. So now let's conjecture. So half of you were right, and the third of you were wrong, and the other third, or that's not actually equal to one. <laughs> um, the rest of you didn't quite take sides. But now that we know the German flag is in fact smaller, can you kind of fix your answers if you said French to understand and reason why this is in fact smaller on disk? Someone from this side. You're kind of too much in the middle. How about that? <laughs> because you have to start over with this one. You go blue for a while, and then white, and then red, and then you have to do blue again. Perfect. Yeah. So it's actually, so that's precisely it. If the algorithm pretty much says, describe the whole row as succinctly as possible, unfortunately, you have to do extra work in the French flag, because you can only summarize one third of the flag, roughly. But then you have to start over and summarize the next third. Then you have to start over, then summarize the next third. And then you can move on to the next row. And so that costs you something, because you can't as succinctly represent the entire row. Yeah? So it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that red and blue already exist within like, the, the, the part of the three colors that make it up. So the fact that you have to make black and you have to make yellow doesn't matter. No, because the pixels themselves are still using, in this case, probably 8 bits per pixel. So the same number of bits are being used, essentially, for each pixel. So it doesn't really matter what the actual colors are. So the palette, so to speak, is the same in both of these images. They both have access to the same range of colors, even though one is just using black, red, yellow, and the other one is using blue, white, red. OK, so can we do better than this file format? Well, besides GIFs, there are also what other popular file format that we've mentioned tonight and most of you are probably even more familiar with? Yeah, so JPEG. So Joint Photographers Experts Group, which you should never have to utter or remember again. Um, so this is a file format that supports not 256 colors, but guess how many? We can take the E1 answer of more colors. <laughs> can we refine that a little bit? So 1,028 or 1,024 would probably be the number. Even more than that. Even more than that. So we pretty much go in exponentially larger bounds. So instead of 8-bit color, we go up to 16 color, as you saw on my monitor, up to 32-bit color. So JPEGs are actually 24-bit color, I believe, maybe more, 24-bit color. And what do you get if you do 2 to the 24, anyone? We can, it's reasonable to say these are millions of colors. And that's why they are most popular for photographs, for instance. Many of your cameras, if not all of your cameras, in addition to supporting potentially other file formats, odds are support the JPEG file format because not only they've, got, they've, just, they've gotten popular, first and foremost, but they've gotten popular partly because they are more expressive, in a sense, than JPEGs. And they can't be animated, but they are, in fact, compressed. But the interesting thing about their compression is that it's not as succinctly implemented and not as reversibly implemented as in the case of these flags here. And so for that, we'll turn to a discussion in a moment of compression, lossiness, or uh, losslessness. But before that, do we have Famsterdam? Spread? I was going to say, can your JPEG do this? <laughs> <laughs> OK, my computer's embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the link later. <laughs> so anyway. Um, there's I actually, think you get, did not give that nearly enough airtime. Nearly enough? I think it was far too long. <laughs> Would anyone like to see the hamster dance just for another couple of seconds? Yeah. Overruled, I'm afraid. No. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. OK. Uh, I swear, I catch on to internet memes years after most people, and I am rediscovering this now and loving it. 
You know, there are far more obnoxious sites now that have flashing colors in addition to these rows of dancing hamsters. I mean, they, they can get really horribly obnoxious. Luckily now, this seems relatively tame in comparison. In fact, a little catchy. Yes, it comes with the music. That is not my, <laughs> rest assured, I don't have iTunes hiding in the background playing some catchy tune. <laughs> okay. Is that enough now? <laughs> All right. But it's just getting to the good part in the song. Okay. <sighs> anyway, so another way. Tell us about lostlessness. Lostlessness, we're not there yet. Oh. We still have this one. So there is, um, to put another way in the same sort of horizontal encoding, you can see that this is another way of looking at it where now in this photograph of an apple, or it's just an image of an apple, we mostly have a blue background. And in order to compress this, all we really need to do is just say the same thing. So uh, just as we had done before, the first pixel in the row is blue, and all of the pixels after that in the first row are also blue. Uh, the, where it gets tricky is right where the apple starts to interrupt the rows. And so this is just exactly similar to the French flag from before, where while we can compress the rows up until the red of the apple, we have to then recompress starting at the other end. So starting from the very right side of the apple all the way to the end of that particular row. So this is just another way of looking at the exact same thing at this GIF compression. There are different ways to compress these images. So uh, we've been talking just very generally about compression, but realize that different methods of compression can have a very large effect on your image. So this is yet another image uh, that I took uh, while rafting in New Mexico. And if we are to zoom in on this guy's face while applying different forms of compression, we can see two very different results. And so if, um, just to show you as an example, if I want to zoom in on this same square, zoom in really far, you can see approximately how it looks, just as it is. And you can see this is essentially the uncompressed form. We are not doing any sort of compression. It's just displaying on our screen. We are zooming in just to show you what it looks like. And so we have this notion of lossy compression and lossless compression. The difference is that lossless compression, we do the compression, but we don't lose any information. So if we go back a couple slides, we can completely reconstruct each of these flags without modification. There's no difference in the end result after we decompress this image. So we do this fancy compression where we uh, take each row and we compress it down to one pixel per row, for example, in the German flag. But when we Re, when we uncompress it, when the computer shows it to us, there is no change in the end quality. However, JPEGs differ slightly from GIFs. While GIFs have this lossless compression, JPEGs typically, typically have a lossy compression, where if you use a very, uh, very high compression ratio, so you try to make the image as small as possible, you'll notice that you get these additional blocks. And that's because of the way, it's, the J, the way that JPEG uh, does its compression is a bit different, but it's also lossy. It makes assumptions about how we view images. And uh, there's a lot of specifics, like it, it tries to dump information that it doesn't think that we would notice. And the way it does that is that it divides each, or it divides the photo into many, many square blocks. And as you increase the compression, you lose more data as it tries to get rid of more data, and you can start to see this block effect, as you can see in this lossy compression to the right. So the takeaway from this is that if you're going to use JPEG files, it's perfectly fine, and uh, many times you can still compress the file without really any perceived difference between the uncompressed and the compressed version while getting a much smaller file but you are losing data in the background. While you may not notice it, just looking at the image, there is some data loss in the background. So every time you resave the file as a JPEG, you're losing just a little bit more, just a little bit more of the data every time you resave it. So the point is with the lossy compression, every time you resave it, you are losing data, you are losing quality. But with the lossless compression, you can resave it as many times as you want 
and not have to worry about losing the quality for it. So with JPEGs, if you, if you have a digital camera, you take JPEG files with it, you download them to your computer, do not change those files. Make a copy of them, store the originals. Because every time you resave that JPEG file, uh, you are making a destructive change to it. You're losing small amounts of bits. And trust me, you can try this at home. If you uh, have a JPEG file and you resave it, resave it, resave it, after, it uh, depends on how much compression you use, but after about 10 times or so, you'll notice that you're really degrading the quality of your image. So do just keep an, uh, the original lossy compressed file that you have before you make any changes to it. Don't make any changes to that one file. Make a copy of it first and then you can make changes to that one. You know, a really nice tie-in here is to think of digital photos that you might have taken or someone else might have taken that they've emailed to you. This has happened several times with my, my own mother, for instance, who has been sent photographs from someone and because of reasons of size, whereby you can't really fit really huge images, photographs, into an email. People typically you zoom it, um, uh, scale it down, crop it so that it's something smaller. I mean, she's asked me on multiple occasions, Hi, David, how can I go about printing this to an actual film? And there's a lot of sites out there like KodakGallery.com and, and sites like that. It's not hard. You can go to CVS these days and actually print photos from digital images. But the catch is that if you have compressed the file, not just by increasing the compression ratio, as is the case with here, but you've also decreased the file size by simply shrinking the image itself, decreasing its resolution, thereby similarly throwing away information. You can't necessarily print photographs that might display on your screen like this in a really nice format on, say, actual Kodak paper that you might do at CVS or the like, because you've thrown away information. And so as Dan says, the best practice really is to make sure whatever program you're using to manage your own digital photographs, that it somehow saves original copies somewhere. Even if you go ahead and crop things and click that email to friend feature that's built into a lot of these programs, because odds are you're emailing your friend a version that they can't go to press with, at least not if they want to have a really high quality printed photograph ultimately. Yeah. It, uh, so that is then also representing the volume, right? And I send it by email. The dimensions, mostly, it sounds like. So it sounds like there's a built-in shortcut where you can scale an image down from whatever it is to some known sizes, like 400 pixels or 800 pixels, just popular uh, sizes. So what's happening there is you're taking, say, a 2,000 pixel image and shrinking it to be a fifth of its size or a quarter of its size. And to do that by nature, you're throwing away a lot of information. It might look still, look, still look pretty good at that size, but the problem is if you then try to print it or just blow it up on your screen, then what's happening is the pixelation like Dan's showing where everything starts to get blotchy again. So here, uh, just to hopefully hammer this home, this is the image taken just directly from the slide and loaded into a very basic image editing or image viewing picture. And we can see that uh, if I zoom in on this information, we can see the size of the image. So it is literally 902 pixels wide by 600 pixels down. And it's a TIFF image, which is a type of bitmap. And you can see that it has the corresponding file size of 1.3 megabytes. So if we wanted to shrink the file size, what would we do? If we wanted to keep the same dimensions but shrink the file size, what would we do? Right, we would, we would save it as a different file type, probably some uh, lossy compressed form like JPEG, for example. So we could save it as a JPEG to actually shrink the size of the file. But what if we wanted to shrink the size of the photo? So we're talking about sizes, but there are two different types of sizes. We're talking about the image size, which is 902 pixels by 600 pixels, or the file size, which is the actual size of the file on disk. And so. Uh, to do to change the file size, it's actually uh, as simple as going up to some menu and adjusting its size. We can watch what happens if we change the pixels from 902 pixels to let's say 451 by 300 pixels, which is essentially just having the size of the image. So if I hit OK, you'll notice that it is now exactly half the size, but we have therefore lost that many details in it. Like if I wanted to make it the same size, I could zoom in again by basically zooming it in. But if you were to take a close look, and it's maybe harder to see on the 
the projector, but you can see that it is more pixelated now. So we have lost that additional detail, whereas I can, if I had kept it at its original size, like it is here, it is much, much sharper. So when we're talking about sizes, we're talking about two different things. If someone says that they want the same image, but in a smaller file size, you have to try to increase the compression. But if someone wants maybe both a smaller file size and a smaller image, then you should decrease the file size and save it as something else. And this is actually uh, very important if, if you, even if you um, just doing something relatively simple like trying to sell an object on eBay or, or Craigslist or some other site such as this, you want to make sure that the, your photos are reasonably sized. You don't want them to be these monstrously huge 8 megapixel photos that you put on a web page and then someone has to scroll all over the place to see. You would want to adjust the size accordingly uh, in order to save it and view it properly on a web browser. Do you mind just to be dramatic? Can you shrink it down to say 100 pixels and then zoom back in nine times? All right, let's do the dramatic route here. Adjust size. So I'm all about the drama, the dancing, gerbils, zam, okay. All go. right, 90, we'll do 90, <laughs> 91 by 60, which is about a tenth of the size. Now Very if nice. I zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. You can see just how pixelated it is. And no amount of movie enhance will ever get you back <laughs> the details, the, this, the, uh, the fear on the kids' faces, if you didn't notice. Um, but how about if this is 1.3 megabytes, the file size? That's because I hadn't resaved the file. So it, it's still 1.3 megabytes on disk. But once I resave the file, it would actually be considerably smaller. It would be roughly 10% the size. So it would be now. 130 kilobytes rather than 1.3 megabytes. Okay, so just to summarize, if you don't mind clicking back over to the screen, we've looked at a bunch of popular file formats. Um, we'll focus on the first three here, JPEG, GIF, and PNG. These are the three-letter acronyms by which they go. Raster is just a synonym for bitmap, so it's sort of a fancy word, a fancier way of saying the same thing. And just to summarize, so JPEGs are great for photographs, for instance. They are millions of colors, aka 24-bit color, if you want to be more technical. And they're lossy, compressed. And though the word sounds a bit silly, it literally means what it says. You are losing information by compressing the file. And you have clearly, as Dan has shown, some variable amount of control over how much uh, compression actually happens. GIF, meanwhile, is a bitmap file format as well, but it's lossless. So that clever algorithm we described for the flags and really any GIF file, even including the Apple, is a little more clever because it doesn't, it does throw away information, but it only throws away redundant information that you can recover essentially by reading whatever summary you've used. And that's how the flags look just as good even though they've been compressed. Even that apple, if we had it actually on a file, it would still look the same as the, the original, but we've just used fewer bits to represent what might otherwise be completely redundant. Um, it's meanwhile 8-bit color, so maximum of 256-bit colors, but we did see that it might be animated as well. Pings, meanwhile, and this is one of these uh, open standards that the world, a lot of uh, technophiles in the world have tried to push the world toward. I would say they've not really caught on, these pings, portable network graphics, as much as people might have liked. They're supported by all the major browsers these days, and they're sort of an alternative to GIFs. Because they're, long story short, there were some um, interesting patent issues around the original GIF algorithm, and people wanted to put royalties on it so that anytime you save a file in the GIF format, you got to pay a few pennies to someone else. So this worried a lot of people in the world. They developed an open standard, but it just really hasn't caught on all of that much. But you'll see remnants of this kind of history. In fact, even in Photoshop, if you save a file as GIF, it's actually called CompuServe GIF before these uh, legacy reasons. Um, but it's lossless compression, which is pretty neat because you, again, are not throwing away information. But it is more powerful than GIFs in that it supports 24-bit color. And as the right-hand column suggests, some of these file formats actually support uh, transparency. So whereas JPEGs do not support transparency, and by that I mean the uh, several of these formats do. What do we mean by transparency? Well, any image, including every image we've seen tonight, is a rectangle. No matter what is in that image, it is a rectangle, a grid of pixels. Now that's kind of problematic if, say, you're making a web page and you've got a really nice background or just a colored background. And if you have, for instance, a picture of an apple and you want to center that apple right on the page but not have it be in this really ugly blue background itself or a white background, you just want the apple to shine through, you 
essentially want to be able to say, you know what, the apple is essentially a circle in the middle. And even though I accept the reality that my image has to itself be a rectangle, I want all of these pixels around the apple to be transparent. And with the GIF file format, can you do that? You can also do it kind of, sort of, with the ping file format, although some browser support is lacking for it. You can't do it with the JPEG file format. So when it comes time to make web pages, if you decide that you actually want to be a little fancy and you want to use Photoshop or some other program uh, elements that you're familiar with, if you want to go with a transparent graphic for aesthetic reasons, odds are you'll want to go, for a G, uh, go with a GIF for um, support reasons. But again, there's a trade-off because you only get so many colors with it. Meanwhile, photographs, anything you put on your website that's a photograph in JPEG format, it's going to be a rectangle of some shape or other. So um, when I was talking about EPS as a uh, file format before, it's slightly misleading in that um, the EPS file format actually does just a lot more than that. It, uh, Adobe Illustrator can export its vector graphics to an EPS file format, but it seems that the more common file type for it to save are what is called uh, an AI for Adobe Illustrator format. Um, but I, I still do think that um, EPS files can store, or some of them can store um, vector graphics, even though uh, a variety of them don't actually. And so if we go back to this idea of wireframes, there is this, um, this stunt that somebody pulled number of years ago on the streets of somewhere and uh, they actually made a wireframe car, a wireframe Subaru I think it is, uh, and they parked it on the side of the road and it looks sort of eerie in that it looks very fake but it is actually indeed very very real. There were several photos of it from different sources uh, of the car just sitting on the road and in fact um, I think in somewhere where they had parked it, it was illegally parked, and so they actually got a ticket from <laughs> the city for it, it being parked in that uh, particular location. And also, uh, if we were to go back just briefly, uh, talking about JPEGs and its compression, you're normally given this sort of, um, of option when you are saving a JPEG file. You usually have the option to define the quality of the compression or just how compressed the JPEG, the JPEG is. And so you can see that here it's simplified a bit. It's given from least quality to best quality. We can see how adjusting this would affect the file size. So you can see that two notches down from best would give us a file size on this image of about 275 kilobytes. <coughs> Excuse me. Or if you remember from the information screen that we saw just a moment ago, this, the TIFF form or the bitmap uncompressed form of this image it's about 1.3 megabytes. So we are reducing the file size by a megabyte, which is fairly considerable. But we can change it from very good quality, which would give us not such a good compression at about 800 kilobytes, or we can go to really, really poor quality at 500 or 55 kilobytes. And so this sounds very attractive. And you might say, oh, wow, now I can have my web page load a lot faster if you save your JPEG in this uh, least quality. But as soon as I save it, uh, let's see, save it as untitled. It resaves it with a certain amount of quality, and here you can see that splotchiness that existed in that high compression. So no longer does it look very, uh, very crisp and pristine, but now you see these blocks that are associated with the JPEG compression. So it's this trade-off. How much file size do you want versus how much space do you want to save? And typically, um, when you save a JPEG file, uh, let's see, so I saved it already, but typically what you want is not the best because that's usually too large and what you get, you're getting diminishing returns after a certain point, but just a few notches down. Usually, uh, you're usually given a numeric scale from something like 1 to 12. Usually something like uh, 8 to 10 would work pretty well, or on this scale, uh, the, the left two notches or, or so would be just fine. It's a good, generally a good compromise between file size and compression of the image. Trial and error is probably your friend, to be honest. That's right. But you, what you don't want to do is resave the same image over and over and over again. You'll notice that I, what I did was a save as on this image. Now it's telling me that the file size is going to be 151 kilobytes rather than the 55 that I had just saved it as. Why might this be? Why is it going to save a file that's bigger than the one I currently have? Remove the file before 50, right? 
Yep, so when I saved this file, it was, it was now a 55 kilobyte image. We can confirm that by looking at the specs here. It's about 56 kilobytes. But now if I go to File, Save As on the same image, what it wants to do is now increase the size to 151 kilobytes rather than 56. Yes? Is it because it's uh, the original file? So no, all of that original information is lost, but I suppose what it's trying to do is save all of these artifacts. So what you would be doing is saving in high quality all of the artifacts that you've already introduced into this image. And by artifacts, I mean all the splotchiness, the blocks, etc. So this is something else to watch out for. You're not going to get any detail back by resaving a file, a very small file, as one that's uh, compressed less or that has better quality. Again, this comes back to the same idea that we've been talking about where you're not going to retrieve or you're not going to get back quality that you've lost. So be careful with that. If you have an image that's a certain size and you're trying to save it as the same file type, there's generally no point in giving it uh, better quality compression. So we've teased you with multimedia, namely audio snippets. Do you mind switching over here? So why don't we try to slap some concepts around these? And to motivate this, let me introduce you to a beautiful song, horribly rendered. So this is Beethoven's fifth, but implemented by way of a file format called MIDI, M-I-D-I. And if any of you have uh, musician friends who maybe have a nice keyboard in the uh, musical sense, not in the computer sense, they might actually be able to connect their digital keyboard, their piano, to a computer. And by playing notes on their keyboard, can they record those same notes in the form of musical notes, A's and B's and C's and sharps and flats and so forth, in a computer program? Well, what you're hearing is a rendition of Beethoven's Fifth stored by way of its musical notes and simply played sort of verbatim by the computer. But it's a very coarse kind of experience. It's not particularly pleasurable. So contrast that with, for instance, something like this, which is the same song. These are actual strings. This is an actual recording of an orchestra, and this is in what file format, if you glimpse the file name? Uh, sorry? Okay, sorry, it's a little louder here now. Uh, MP3, so MPEG uh, layer three. So an MP3 file, if, you've, uh, if you have any illegal music on your computer, odds are it's in the MP3 file format. So if you think back a few years to the whole Napster controversy, it was largely MP3s that were being illegally shared on the internet. And to this day, they, are very, they, are, they remain a very popular file format, although there's a few others that we'll cover in just a bit, some of them uh, very nicely integrated into Apple's iTunes these days. But MP3s are interesting interesting because unlike bitmaps, they actually store recordings. They don't store just musical notes that get somehow recited by the computer. They store waveforms and they actually store the original sound information, but they do so a lot more efficiently than would, say, a store-bought CD. So consider this, even though it's probably not been all that, uh, you, most of us probably don't buy CDs proper all that much anymore. How much information, think back to hardware, our hardware lectures, can you store on a CD? Yeah, so like 700, 800 megabytes. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's just simplify and say, you know, a typical artist releases a CD that's got 10 songs on it, give or take. So if it's an 800 megabyte CD, well, that's like how many megabytes per song? OK, so 80. So 80 megabytes per song. That's actually pretty big, because in fact, if you look at your iPods or you look at iTunes or whatever musical software you're using, if any, how big is a typical song on your computer? 24 what? Ooh, probably, well, if you're doing very high fidelity, but odds are it's much smaller than that. So maybe three megabytes, four megabytes. I mean, if you're a real audiophile, that might be completely unacceptable to you. But I would argue that most humans, myself included, can't really tell the difference between a three megabyte MP3 and, say, a 10 megabyte MP3. And the reason that an MP3 file, such as you would find on your own computer or your iPod, is so much smaller is that, like all these images we've been talking about, they are compressed. But the interesting thing with audio is that all, most, if not all, audio compression is pretty much lossy 
compression, whereby the only way you can use fewer bits to store something that was heard in reality is to just throw some of that information away. Fortunately, humans are not all that finely tuned a uh, device. So whereas a computer might be able to actually detect differences between the 80 megabyte version of a song and the 3 megabyte version of the song or the 8 megabyte version of the song, many humans, and again myself included, can't really tell the difference. Or at least it's not 10 times worse to compress the file from 80 down to 8. And so what's nice about the MP3 file format is that you typically get a compression ratio, so to speak, of about 10 to 12 times. So you take a file that is like 80 megabytes and you can fairly nicely whittle it down to something that's just 3 megabytes or 5 megabytes and you probably can't really tell the difference, at least not on headphones that you probably have in your ears or even on a medium range um, sound system that you might have in your home. So just like what JPEGs do for images, MP3s do for sound, where it throws away, there's certain assumptions that the compressor actually performs about what a human will be able to hear when replaying the sound, and it throws away the information that it thinks you will not hear, specifically some very high frequencies, for example. So as you start to increase the compression on an MP3, you will typically start to hear uh, let's say like the, the hi-hats in a, in a band, for example, or um, the hi-hat in, in a drum set that starts to degrade in quality just a little bit before you start to hear other things degrade. And so when you start hearing that, you start to realize that, okay, I'm starting to compress it just a little bit much, just like when you can start to notice the blockiness or the splotchiness that exists on a JPEG file, you can realize, okay, I'm compressing it just a little bit too much. But just like all of these things, it's a, it's a trade-off, it's a toss-up. How much data do you want to throw away at the expense of, the, of its quality? It's still, a pretty good, um, it's still a pretty good effect. So this is a three megabyte file. You might recognize the song. Oh, it's very good, yeah. Frankly, the limiting factor in this room is probably the quality of these actual speakers, since we don't really have the best equipment in here, audio-wise. But if you plug these into your ears with nice headphones, or into a nice set of speakers connected to your computer or your sound system, this would actually sound pretty good. But just like with JPEGs, you do have discretion over how many, really, bits you use per second in order to encode an MP3. And common values would be something somewhat low, like 64 kilobits per second, um, maybe a little higher, 96 kilobits. 128 is kind of a nice sweet spot, or 192. And we can see this. And let me actually see. Uh, sort of on-the-fly demos rarely work as planned. But what I'm going to pull up here is iTunes. And in addition to being able to play MP3s and CDs and movies and AAC and all these other file formats, some from Apple, what, C, um, what uh, iTunes also comes with is streaming radio, which is sort of an interesting topic unto itself. But we'll use it here for just a moment to pick on some radio stations that if we click on the tab, say for pop radio, notice that all these are all radio stations, most of them based in the US, and notice they all offer different bit rates. Now let's see if we can have one that comes in different formats. So here, this, hopefully this will be a good one. So only the best hits, no ads, live from France, in fact. So because it's international, odds are you know, there might be some uh, bandwidth issues, and so maybe I'd prefer to use the lower bit rate so that the bits actually keep up and you don't get that buffering effect like you do on YouTube and with video. So let's hear the 20 24 kilobit version of best radio if it works. So that sounds bad on so many levels. <laughs> okay, so that's the 24 bit version. Oh, that's the 64. Oh, it looks like that's. They changed it, the 64-bit version. It looks like iTunes resynchronized itself. Let's see if there's a 128-bit version. Still horrible, same horrible song, but hopefully sounds a little better. So much, no, still bad, but so much better. So, and that's the difference in bit rates. Just as Dan was sort of giving you higher quality JPEGs, so is that a higher quality radio stream or audio compression. So when we're talking about this bit rate, what are we actually referring to? Is it the actual size of the file necessarily? So can you bring that back up actually? So we had, for example, we were just looking at this 128 kilobit per second versus 64 kilobit per second. What are we actually saying? What does this mean about the file or the audio stream that we are listening to? Just take a wild guess. 
density. So that's a good way to put it. That's, you can think of it um, as the density of bits per second. That's how many bits are being sent to your computer, in this case from France, to be decoded and then replayed on your computer. So you can imagine that when you have more bits to work with, you'll have more data, just like when we were talking about uh, in JPEG, when you have less compression, you have more data to work with, you'll get a better quality result. So it does imply something uh, to do with the file size. You can infer that, for example, a 128 kilobit per second MP3 file will be roughly twice the size of a 64 kilobit per second file. And that's just because every second of audio you're referring to, Group Salad is actually a really great radio station, but it is not a very good replacement for me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, now that I've completely lost my train of thought. Then my job is done. <laughs> so for every second, oh, I've lost it. Never mind. <laughs> so <It's> just <laughs> as last week's takeaway for you is hopefully to use Google Earth for the first time, I do urge you, if you don't already have it installed, and even if you do, to find in iTunes the radio link because there's a wonderful trove of songs out there. I mean, this is one of the reasons I personally don't even buy CDs anymore is because you can have this sort of free stream of music coming to you. Uh, it's very easy. So go to iTunes.com, which will lead you to Apple's website. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a link that says download the software now. And so, so yeah, just go to iTunes.com, and it will, re it will redirect you to the uh, appropriate location. You're just going to download that software by clicking iTunes 8, free download. It'll download some kind of installer to your desktop, most likely. Double-click it as usual and, and run it, just following the prompt saying pretty much yes to everything. And you'll eventually get an icon that looks like this somewhere on your computer, probably on your desktop. And it's fairly simple software. When it loads for the first time, you might have to click some prompts. But somewhere on the left-hand side, you will see this option, radio. And then you'll see this huge list of categories. And if you click each category, you'll get the list of stations. And playing one is just double click it. So it if you have work. an iPod, you most likely already have iTunes installed in order to sync with it. It's the same software. Or if you have a Mac, it's the same, it's the same thing. But there are some other file formats in addition to MP3. So we talked about different types of compression when we were referring to images. What were the two types of compression that we were talking about? Right, lossy and lossless. So just like there is a lossy form of audio, which is MP3, we can imagine that there's a lossless compression. And these, aren't, these are not as popular because uh, they don't do as good of a job as, say, MP3. But still, they are somewhat popular. Some of them are, uh, for example, I mean, they have some crazy names. I think one is Monkey's Audio or something like that. And another one is FLAC, F-L-A-C. And uh, I think even iTunes uh, has... An, has a lossless form of a lossy format called AAC, which is just the type of file similar to MP3. But all of these files, just like, let's say, a TIFF file or a, or a GIF file, um, all of these file types can compress the same audio exactly the same as it's originally intended uh, into a smaller file while retaining all of the data. However, audio files tend to be huge, absolutely huge. I think the rule for an uncompressed file is about 10 megabytes per second or something like that, or is it 10 megabytes per minute? I forget. It's something ridiculously large, and so every time that you need to, um, uh, it, it, must be set, it must be 10 megabytes per minute with a 700 megabyte CD, you get about 70 minutes of, of playtime. Anyway, it's something very, very large, and so um, if, even if you can have that file size, we're using one of these uh, lossless compression techniques, you can really help things out on, on your hard drive space. So. so for time's sake, why don't we transition to perhaps the form of multimedia that we probably most frequently interact with. And it turns out that most of the discussions we've been having now come full circle into this sort of combined format. Because we've looked at graphics. And really, most videos are just a sequence of graphics that flash in front of you really quickly. And they certainly tend to have audio overlays. So video is sort of the intersection of all the stuff we've been looking at thus far. Um, what kinds of, uh, what formats exist for video today that you're probably familiar with? AVI. So AVI, sure, let me just make a quick running list so that we have it in front of us. So AVI, MKV, okay, MP4, FLV, what's that? MPEG, okay, so you have MPEG, uh, several different versions. You've got MPEG1, MPEG2, 
And now I'll do my leading question. Oh, and let's do a couple more. So QuickTime, uh, other biggies? What's that? OK, real video, for better or for worse. Not the nicest format in the world, I'd say. Any others you want to toss up there? WMV? Ah, WMV, the w Windows uh, contribution. OK, so let's start with this list. And here's my leading question, as always. How many of you have ever seen an FLV file? The answer to these questions is always yes, right? So, <laughs> so have you ever used YouTube? YouTube, yeah, maybe snuck a peek at something stupid on YouTube. So YouTube uses files in flash format, or FLV, which refers to the file extension, .flv. You typically don't download flash movies, per se, because instead you watch them embedded in the computer screen. And much like this radio was being streamed to us, quote unquote, from France, so our YouTube videos stream to you from wherever YouTube servers happen to be. And a streaming video format, as the word kind of uh, implies, is a file that you don't download it's an entirety and then double click on your hard drive, but rather it's streamed to you piece by piece by piece so that for a couple of reasons. Why might it be advantageous to distribute video content in this kind of streaming format as opposed to a downloadable format, which almost all of these other formats are, with just a few exceptions? Yeah? So get more users in what sense? Um, so Okay, good. And let me uh, let me pick on the last suggestion, even though it's right in part. So one of the reasons that Flash LLV files have become so popular, case in point, YouTube, is because most browsers today, probably all browsers today, come with a built-in Flash player. And this is because Macromedia, now Adobe's software, the Flash plugin, has just gotten so popular that most manufacturers, like uh, the Mozilla Foundation and Microsoft and uh, Google and other companies that Apple, who ship browsers, they include this plugin with their browser. So even though it, it does technically require special software, the reality is that it just comes with most people's computers these days. So you visit a web page, and odds are it will just work. And even if not, browsers have gotten smart enough such that they can usually prompt you and say, do you want to install the requisite plugin, quote unquote, for this page? And then you get the software fairly quickly. So it's streaming, though, too, because not so much because it lets you not so much for the reason you described, but because one, these videos do tend to be large. E1's videos that some of you might have watched on the course's website are each 200, 300, even 400 megabytes large. That kind of takes a while to download it its entirety. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe even more than that. And that's kind of annoying and counter to the notion of video on demand. And so what's nice about streaming formats, much like iTunes, is that even though there might be a slight delay, like we saw that progress bar for a moment, it was buffering in a sense, well, it allows you to nonetheless start watching the video pretty quickly, which itself is compelling. Also, there's this interesting uh, upside for intellectual property purposes. It is possible to download and save streaming file formats to your computer, like YouTube videos, like real videos, and like a whole bunch of other file formats that normally are embedded in a browser. It's not obvious how you can do it, but if you have the right skills or software installed on your computer, absolutely. Any bits you're streaming to the user's computer can be saved on the user's computer, even though a lot of companies have spent a lot of time trying to make this difficult. But that is one upside in that NBC, when they distribute TV shows on their website, they use their own special plugin sometimes or their own streaming format just because it makes it ever so harder for normal people off the street to actually save those videos, which for them has a potential financial upside. So what about MPEG-2? Another leading question. Hopefully you're learning the trick. How many of you have ever watched an MPEG-2 video before? Yes, there's no way to learn, so it just doesn't sink in. <laughs> All of you, if you've ever watched a DVD, so the file format actually used on consumer DVDs that you would rent from Blockbuster or Netflix are stored in MPEG-2 format. So suffice it to say, there's been a whole history of different file formats. QuickTime was developed by Apple and is what you would download videos in from the iTunes Store, for instance. It's also one of the formats you can download this own course's videos from in the course's website if you actually do want to copy it down to your local computer, maybe put it on your iPod. Real video, um, my personal opinion, is a god-awful format because the only way you can play it on your computer is by installing, as is the case with a lot of these things, 
real media's own proprietary software, which for some unknown reason thinks I actually care about when real media has news to provide me with and thus puts little pop-ups on my screen to inform me as much. It's very obtrusive software. And actually, if you've ever taken a course, ironically, at Harvard's Extension School that's not this one um, and that's online, you've been watching probably real video files, whereas Chris here uses Flash and QuickTime and MP3 formats because I think both Dan and I are quite averse to the real video file format. You want to pluck off a couple of these others? So there's an important distinction that should be made here. So when we're talking about video files, it's usually a combination of things. It's not just a video as it is. It's always a video file and an audio file. And the two must be mashed together. And so many of these file types are actually what are called containers. They contain both the video and the audio in one. And so a number of these containers, for example, AVI or QuickTime, can have different types of video inside of it. So just like we were talking about with an audio file, we can have MP3 or a WAV file or a FLAC file for uncompressed. In a similar fashion, we can have one container hold different types or different encoded uh, audio and video files. So you can mix and match. So typically, uh, you'll often hear this, um, this fancy new encoding technology called H.264, which is used very frequently with HD video. However, H.264 is just a way of encoding video, and a number of these file formats can actually contain H.264 video files or video compressed files. So, for example, QuickTime, AVI, MKV, and I believe WMV can all store H.264 video inside of them. So, just because you have one of these file formats, it doesn't really say much about the type of compression that exists for the video or for the audio. You typically have to uh, have a program that will tell you how each of these different things are encoded. And so, if I can steal the, uh, the focus away from you for a minute, uh, I actually have a video here that is in HD video. Uh, let's see, which is pretty fun, but it's off of Apple's website. And so, we'll just show very quickly, maybe just a minute or two before we move on and talk a bit just a little bit about HD very, very quickly. So this is pretty neat because it's actually a combination of a lot of the things that we have been talking about. It's computer graphics, so it has all of these polygons that are happening. It's all of these sounds. But now if we focus on the video format itself, we will notice that it gives us a bit of information. So for example, here we can see that we have, uh, for the audio, we have an AAC format, which is Apple's competition to MP3. It tells us, uh, let's see, uh, the audio, does it show me the audio rate? It doesn't here, but we can see that it does give us some other things as well. So we see two formats. We see the audio format, AAC. We see the video format, H.264. So what makes video HD? This is sort of a question that seems to be becoming more and more popular these days with this HD term being thrown around. It's just literally just a certain size of video. And I don't mean file size, I mean image size. So you'll notice here that we have uh, a file size or an image size of 1280 by 720. And so this typically translates to HD video that represents <coughs> 720p. However, there are some other files or there are other image sizes as well, such as 1920 by 1080, which is considerably larger, but that is either 1080i or 1080p as, and, as required. And so um, all of these things are, are very important when we are talking about video because, like I said, all HD really is, it's just a bigger file size. Whereas DVD is typically not 720p, it's usually a different size entirely, 480p, which is 852 by 480. So just a little tiny bit smaller than this 1280 by 720 that we have been talking about. And just to give you an idea of the difference in size, so this is the actual size of this, um, 
of this 480p or of this, uh, uh, this DVD quality video. You can see approximately how large it is on my screen. But if I switch over to the HD video, it looks small, but that's because I have it set at a small zoom. So if I make it actual size, you can see suddenly it's actually larger than the resolution of my screen. Um, so let's see. So HD video, like I said, is just an increasing size of the image, and it doesn't really say much about anything else. But realize that even though this is a QuickTime file, and we can tell because the extension of the file, if we look at the source line at the top, the file name ends in .mov, so the QuickTime format, the QuickTime container is typically called MOV. It is actually a container that has two, you know, you can think of it as having two separate files in it. The video file, the H.264 compressed video file, and the AAC compressed audio file. So before we run out of tape, the sneak preview for next week is that we're about to dive into website development and teach you a little something about HTML, CSS, and embedding these kinds of images into your site. But I thought we, um, at Dan's request, would end on a note that's uh, currently on my screen. If you wouldn't mind switching over. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>